Okay, great. Good morning. Um, welcome. My name is Lily. On behalf of the CUBE team, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first uh, within our webinar series titled Crisis Management in Payments. I sincerely hope that you're all well and safe, and I thank you for being here today. We have 60 participants registered from all over Europe. And it sounds like we've lost Lily there, but uh, I'm certainly here. Rich, you still here? I'm still here, Robert. Always here. Before <laughs> so uh, I, I think uh, while we wait for Lily to come back on, uh, Rich and I would like to introduce ourselves. Um, hopefully many of you know us from the industry. We've been in the industry uh, many, many, many years. And, uh, and in fact, the, the whole thing of, uh, of, of electronic money and prepaid and all that whole sort of uh, neo-banking stuff started. I think when uh, Rich and I went to Cafe Nero uh, near uh, St. Paul's uh, in about 2001. So uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, Rich and I uh, go back to the beginning of this uh, fintech industry. Uh, and it's been through many, many uh, turbulent times, but uh, none, none as, uh, as, uh, as in crisis as we have today. So Rich, do you want to say a few words? Well, no, I think you uh, introduced it well. Uh, Robert and I go way back uh, and have seen a number of uh, cycles, uh, both credit cycles, economic cycles, but uh, certainly uh, look, looking forward to this discussion. Because I, I don't believe we've ever had a situation where you take a social uh, and um, epidemic or pandemic uh, issue and lay that on top of economic um, uh, impacts uh, to the payments and financial services industry. So, uh, yeah, uh, been around the block for a while, but I think there's a uncharted territories for all of us to uh, examine and review as we go through today uh, and through um, uh, the next couple months. So we've got a, a great show ahead from you today. Um, I think Lily is back online. So Lily, do you want to just uh, finish off your intro? I am. Sorry, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I, I think these technical challenges are very much going to be part of our everyday lives. And my, my real point was uh, that I wanted to just bring across is that along with every other industry globally having to challenge to innovate and change, the only thing certain is the fact that, you know, I feel that we're more part of a global community and our only real option these days is to is to relook at how we communicate, how we connect with our networks, how we implement new strategies, security, everything. And Cube wants to be part of it and is part of that change. So we're here to support you as much as we can and secure new networks and build on our strong ecosystem as well as provide a platform for knowledge exchange and expertise. I would very, very much like to thank our speakers for taking the time and uh, for preparing your presentations and sharing your insights. Um, also, a big thank you to all to our um, supporting partners, Content Networks and the Cyprus International Business Association. Thank you for helping us promote this webinar. A very big thank you to our chairman, our coordinators, uh, Rich and Robert. Thank you so, so much. And a huge thank you to the CUBE team. You guys have done an amazing job in getting this up and running. And we hope to be delivering many more in, in, the, in the very near future. And finally, um, thank you. I hope that we exchange knowledge and, and, uh, and, and uh, feedback through our chats, through our, through our polls. And um, thank you. I wish you all a very enjoyable webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lily. Really. Um, just by way of housekeeping, um, just to let you know, uh, I'll, I'll be introing the, the, the first three items and Rich will be introing the last four. And then Rich and I will be giving you our sort of expert feedback on, on those uh, seven presentations or six presentations and one, one round table. Um, so without further ado, in, in, in this uh, very uh, tight space, uh, we look like we're well on time. Uh, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, uh, his name is Chris Crespo, uh, and he's a futurist and digital strategist. Um, and, and previously at Nordea, I have seen his slides. They're, they're very exciting. Um, and uh, Chris, I would uh, can I see Chris on the uh, stage? Is Chris here? Because uh, that... I can't see Chris on the stage. So. Um, <laughs> 
That's the the difference. But he's coming. He's coming. It's just uh, leading me out. So just give him a uh, yeah two seconds. Okay, that's good. So I mean, we, we, we've seen a, a lot of uh, changes in our industry over time, but I think this whole uh, push at the moment is seeing a, a, things like a drive down of cash. We've seen massive uh, reductions in ATM withdrawals. Um, we've seen the push up of limits. The, the quick movement of. Uh, of, of Europe to get the limits pushed up on contact lift because people don't like touching things in case they pick up the virus. So the industry has has moved very quickly, I think, in this space uh, as a result of what's going on. Um, and I, I think we we are helping uh, the, the the future of the world by, by pulling out cash, which is dirty in itself, and uh, and uh, helping people to uh, make payments in in these difficult times. Uh, Chris is now with us. Chris, uh, welcome on stage and please take the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I am currently connecting from Vietnam, where I've been stuck for the past three weeks as a result of this, uh, this crisis. So uh, that is just to say that uh, if uh, I apologize in, in advance, if my streaming quality is not great, uh, that we've been having some challenges with, uh, with the reliability of, of Wi-Fi here. So uh, Let's hope, let's hope that this lasts at least for the next 20 minutes. <clears throat> uh, and just very quickly before, before I start, um, I, I work as a futurist in financial services, and uh, many of you might be wondering, so what on earth is a futurist and what does a futurist do? And well, basically, just to clarify that, um, I work with uh, incumbent banks mostly uh, and with other, other organizations in financial services to help them future-proof their, their strategy, especially when it comes to their, to their digital strategies. Um, uh, I help them uh, jumpstart their digital transformations, and I do that by basically focusing on three main things. Uh, I look at what's changing industry-wide uh, in financial services across the globe, but also what is changing across other industries, because that's ultimately impacting the expectations that customers in financial services industries have. Um, I also look at what are the changing behaviors uh, across different generations, uh, and how that impacts the, the way in which uh, incumbent banks need to service those, those expectations and requirements. And finally, I look at banks' capabilities for transforming, and this is really looking at their digital mindset and uh, their culture. Uh, and I work with them to implement things like uh, experimentation, uh, design thinking, and these sort of practices that help banks become more adept to the, to the times. So uh, having said that, um, I will go straight in, uh, and uh, I don't know if, uh, am I able to control my slides here? Because uh, I can see them flicking. Um, they're flicking back, all right? Great, so, um, so just, just to get started, um, I guess if, if you're anything like me, you've probably been in initiatives, uh, and for years, you probably felt the same pain uh, that myself and, and, and colleagues in a similar situation have, which is, that there's never really been a burning platform for, for, for digital transformation. You've probably been part of conversations where you go like, well, you know, the customers really want that, or uh, should we really be investing all this money in transforming and becoming digital? Uh, you know, everything's fine, or is it? Uh, or you, you hear things like, well, you know, we have millions of customers, revenues are up, is there really any need to do this now? And, and if you're anything like me, you find that really frustrating to really convey the urgency and the need for banks to really jump on the, on the digital wagon. Uh, so um, I think most of that is probably going to be dispersed within the next few months as we are now facing a crisis that unfortunately is affecting a lot of people, uh, a lot of people's health and a lot of people's uh, livelihoods uh, through the economic impact, but at the same time is generating the perfect storm that financial organizations needed to really uh, establish that sense of urgency. So uh, if we go to the next slide, um, I want to start by quoting, um, I, I think, uh, can I move it here? Yeah, okay, so uh, slide two. I want to start by quoting this man. I, I think it's probably difficult to recognize him, so I won't ask if anyone knows who this person is. Instead of just a picture of Milton Friedman. Uh, Milton Friedman, as you, most of you know, was uh, one, perhaps the most prominent economic thinker of the 20th century. Uh, he was a, a Nobel Prize winner in, in economics. And most of his thinking around free market capitalism is what permeates what we understand today as, as the market in, in, in developed capitalistic countries. Um, 
In fact, most of his thinking still remains uh, up to date in a lot of the things that, uh, that governments do and the way in which they implement policies. And the reason I'm quoting him is because he said something really interesting, which is that all, uh, um, only a crisis, whether actual or perceived, which is a very interesting way of framing this, is, is not necessarily a real crisis, but as long as people perceive there is a crisis, only this type of crisis produces real change, right? And I think this is the situation we're in. While previously we were uh, throttling along uh, on the digital transformation, we are now facing a real crisis that requires a real transformation from within our organizations to adapt to the, to the, to the changes. So uh, if we go to the next slide, um, basically today I, I want to talk about uh, first uh, four things that I've noticed, and probably you, all of you have noticed as well, that are changing in terms of behaviors, in terms of patterns, and in terms of how, um, uh, how customers are, are, are now changing their, uh, their purchasing habits that have a direct impact on financial services and more specifically organizations. And then in the second part of my presentation, I will talk about what I believe are the, the actions that uh, incumbent banks and payment companies can take to adapt to some of these changes. So uh, if we start by looking at uh, the next slide, uh, let me see. Don't know if, yes, here we go. The next slide. Uh, you know, I, 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 almost, I struggled with putting this, this message into the presentation because it, to an extent it's, it's plainly obvious, right? We all know that this is happening. We have all been affected by this and we've all taken part of our consumption habits online since this uh, health crisis started a few weeks ago. Um, but I think it's worth noting a, a couple of things. Uh, as we know, e-commerce has been growing exponentially since, uh, since 2007, right? Back then, uh, the proportion of retail that was uh, carried out online was just about 5% of the total retail revenue, at least that's, in the, that's true in the US. Uh, and just uh, in 2019, that number had grown up to 16%. 16% of all retail activity now pl takes place online. Now, what's happening is that through this crisis, as companies have to reinvent themselves and reinvent the distribution models, and as uh, people are restricted and homebound, of course, economic activity online, in online channels is increasing dramatically. Uh, up to the point that some estimates suggest that by the end of the year, up to 20% of all retail activity will take place online. And you might think, well, that's not really that much. But if you think about it, that means that one out of every, uh, every five items that you buy, you will be buying online on average. And that's, that's true mostly for Europe and, and the US. But if you consider that things that have to be purchased, um, that have to be purchased, uh, on the physical location, like like petrol or the, the bar of chocolate that you purchase from the corner store, uh, you know, it's a significant increase on online activity. And of course, this has an impact on payment solutions, payment solutions that need to enable customers to be able to pay remotely, to identify them remotely and to securely carry out those transactions. But also the merchants, the merchants that are now in a very quick fashion evolving their business models and their distribution models to have online distribution. So I think one, that's one of the main things that is putting payments companies under duress. How do we continue to support our customers as they migrate their, their business from the physical channel to the online channel? Um, the next thing I've noticed, and you probably picked this up as well in the news, is on the next slide, is that whenever you go to the ATM, you are actually taking home more than just cash. And this is based on a number of, of studies, uh, mainly uh, coming out of the US, where they've uh, analyzed all the germs that can be found in the, in the, key, in the keypads on ATMs and also in the keypads of uh, chip and pin machines. Um, what they found is that there's more than 3,000 different types of bacteria in, in keypads. And in most, uh, in most of the cases, they found the traces of uh, streptococcus pneumonia on, on, on keypads and ATMs, uh, which cause uh, meningitis and, and pneumonia. Uh, and, and that's, uh, you know, if you think about it, that's, that's kind of like unsanitary, right? But you might be thinking, well, yeah, Chris, a big deal. We've, we've been using these things for a while. We know they're disgusting and, and probably no one has ever died of something they caught on in one of these things. But of course, as this health crisis increases and, and as the virus propagates, then the prospect of really catching something that could be extremely harmful to your health, something that can even kill you when you use these, uh, these ways of accessing cash, becomes a reality. Uh, to the point that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm based, well, not, not based, I'm stuck in Vietnam for the, for the time being. Vietnam has a very cash-based economy. Uh, and just a few days ago, I went out to the ATM and the person in front of me had a little spray bottle and she was uh, spraying the handle of the door for the ATM and then she was using gloves to press in the buttons. And you might think, okay, well, that's a bit exaggerated. 
But the reality is that people are finding it much more concerning to go through ATMs or to use their cards to get access to cash or to perform payments. So the question here remains is, how will this evolve and what can payment companies do to reduce the risk of contagion in items that exchange hands regularly, right? Because it's not just uh, having the access to cash, it's also other payment mechanisms. So if we go to the next slide, uh, this is, uh, this I, I believe is uh, it's, it's quite, uh, quite shocking, but um, cash is also in quarantine. Uh, and you might have picked this up on the news, a number of federal reserves across the world have put cash coming from abroad into quarantine for either for between seven and, and 14 days, in some cases exposing the cash to extreme heat to kill any bacteria or any infectious disease that can be uh, concealed within the cash. And in the most extreme case, like in South Korea, they've actually burned the cash. So what's happening here is that there is the notion that cash is becoming uh, a vector for transmission of diseases that makes cash extremely inconvenient and, and a health risk to continue to handle. To the point that the narrative now is uh, is that this crisis might actually accept cashless, uh, cashless economies. Uh, not just anymore for convenience, which has been the rhetoric and the, and the narrative that we've been working with, right? Cashless is very convenient. If you use your digital wallet, it's very convenient. Tap and, uh, tap and pay, very convenient. But now the rhetoric is like, we have to go cashless because cash and handling cash and other forms of payment that require the exchange of, of credit cards, et cetera, poses a real health hazard. So. Again, this is something that is boiling in the environment and really causing a, a significant behavior change in customers that will have a deep impact on payment organizations. Uh, the last thing I wanted to point out here is uh, the fact that we will need to do some readjustments in terms of, in terms of our projections for revenue. Uh, now, McKinsey published a, a report uh, that stated that um, in 2020, the revenue for payments would likely increase by 6% globally. And of course, uh, since, the, since the, the, the pandemic started, they've had to revise these numbers. And now the, the expectation or the estimation is that the numbers will actually be in negative growth of around 8 to 10 percent. And this is, of course, dependent on how long the lockdowns and the restrictions will last. So there is, there is clearly an economic impact uh, around the world. And organizations are going to also be, be, be facing that uh, reduction in activity that will lead to a reduction in revenues. So the big question that's probably at the moment is, what do we do to adapt to this? What are the priorities that we need to pursue and how do we change uh, the, the, the roadmaps that we had uh, in order to address the current concerns? So what I would like to do now is, is point out a few things that I believe uh, are essential for payment companies to, to grasp uh, and that I believe will ensure that payment companies can remain relevant all whilst help, helping address some of the more pressing concerns that uh, that society is facing. So uh, I'm, I'm getting some messages here. Uh, I'm just wanting to make sure that I'm still online. Can you just write something if you can still hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. All good. Great. Thank you. All right. So um, I'll, I'll go on to the next slide. Um, and basically, as, as you probably can have been able to tell, um, adaptability has become the new sexy. Uh, and this goes because uh, previously we've all been throwing around our digital transformations. We've all been trying to include new features on our mobile wallets or new features on our, on, on our, on our mobile apps. And that was sexy, right? Uh, I've heard many banks uh, brag about their, their partnership efforts and how they've partnered with fintechs to add functionality to their, to their offerings, to increase their value proposition in, in ways that delight the customer. And this is really quite interesting because the rhetoric so far has been, we need to transform digitally to delight the customer. However, in this situation, the issue is no longer delighting the customer. The issue is how do we serve the customer immediate need, which is changing basically every day as this uh, pandemic prolongs. So uh, being able to adapt and being able to pivot quickly to bring those solutions to market that are going to help businesses remain up and open and customers perform their transactions is going to become the new the new sexy. Uh, and we have several examples that we've already seen of, of incredibly innovative and adaptive companies that have looked for alternative ways to bring their products and services to market. An example of this is uh, a, a, a pub chain in the UK. Uh, and as you probably know, uh, pubs and bars are very, are very local, very physical types of businesses where 
people go to socialize. Now, of course, in the, in the, in the loom of um, social distancing, um, it becomes really difficult to actually go down to the pub and it is it's potentially uh, risky. So what some of, the, uh, some of the pubs in the UK are starting to do is to say, well, why don't we just deliver food and beverage to our customers? That is not so, I mean, we, we've seen that, right? And a lot of restaurants are using now delivery services like Deliveroo or Vault or Uber Eats to bring their food over to customers. But what's really interesting about what pubs are doing is that they're saying, well, if our customers can't go out to get food or drinks, they probably also can't go out to get other essentials. So why don't we start delivering things like hygienic products or over-the-counter medicines um, to them as we're also take, taking food? So it's really interesting to see how they're changing their value proposition, how they're changing their offering, and they're moving their, their, their business to a delivery type uh, method. Uh, very interesting. Um, we've also seen uh, how gyms and uh, 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 learning, learning organizations have, have moved online, and there's now all these sort of classes that you can take from yoga to exercising at home, from uh, language learning, which uh, really have very quickly adapted to making use of channel as our, as our main channel um, and of course as these organizations are now changing their business models the payment companies that allow them to transact with their customers need to follow them very very closely right because they need to continue to enable that transaction to take place um, we've seen examples uh, of uh, companies that unfortunately will have to close permanently and what eBay and Amazon and Etsy and other these and some of these other companies are doing is they're very quickly addressing that new demand for, for online services and, and, and building packages that help companies take their business online. So, of course, we're going to see an, a, an increased demand of these of this type of services, and that, that will, will mean that uh, these, these organizations will need to have a, a way of either transacting online in a secure way or transacting uh, in a mobile way, and, and we'll get to that in just in a little while. Um, so, um, I think the first thing that uh, payment organizations can do to help alleviate this, uh, this, uh, this issue is accelerate banking the unbanked. And this is because there are 2.5 million unbanked individuals across the globe. And unbanked, unbanked citizens rely very heavily on cash. In fact, the study recently showed that 62% of all transactions made by unbanked people are done in cash in contrast to only 20% for those customers that have access to a bank account. So there is, this is an opportunity to, to create shared value. And shared value is a, is a concept that was, uh, uh, well, has, has been heavily promoted by, by Michael Porter, the famous uh, business strategist, that states that there is a significant amount and an opportunity to, to, to make profit by solving social problems. And those, those in the best position to create innovation to solve social problems are organizations that are for profit and that can... Now, historically, we've always thought about profit and social, social impact as two very separate things that actually don't match, right? The, the, the term profit in, in, in social cycle, cycles are, uh, circles are, it's, it's almost like a dirty word. But in this case, uh, I believe that there is a significant opportunity for businesses to make new lines of revenue by addressing some of the needs and the concerns of the most vulnerable people. Because make no mistake, it is the unbanked people in the world that will suffer this crisis more, more, more dramatically. If the world starts going cashless, it is the people that don't have access to the basic financial services that will suffer the most. So I would encourage payment companies to think, what is it that we can do to, to address uh, unbanked population and to start servicing them, even with basic services that they're gonna be required and will become essential for their survival. Um, the next thing that I think uh, payment companies can do uh, to address the opportunity that, that, that's, uh, that's current at, uh, at the moment is, um, is uh, so let me just, I'm gonna change my slide. Um, we moved on to the next slide. Um, it's, uh, uh, yeah, the next one. Uh, here we go. Yeah, thank you. Uh, is to use the infrastructure that you already have to support the mass distribution of government relief. And if you think about it, several governments around the world are now preparing relief packages to help the most vulnerable people, the people that are losing their employment, the people that are having to close their shops and their li and their sources of livelihood. And it's a significant logistic challenge to get those those relief benefits to people. So 
we now live in a in a in a in a society that has access to to digital channels, where uh, an increasing number of people have access to mobile phones and and, and smartphones, uh, that could act also as a conduit for delivering this relief to to the people that need it the most. Uh, so rather than having to go back to the scenes that we've all seen, oppression where there were queues of people waiting for coupons or waiting for bread, uh, the, the payments organizations can use the network to make those payments from the government get to the to the hands of those who need it the most in the most efficient way and of course in doing that there's additional okay. partnership opportunities. really uh, sorry to butt in here but we've run out of time um we've got right. okay. no coffee breaks unfortunately on this so it makes it uh pretty difficult for us to uh overrun uh there was one question that came through but perhaps we can um uh, feel back in the next session that, that nick's doing so do you, do you just want to have like another 30 seconds to just close sorry yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm basically, I, I would just close in saying that I believe that there is a significant opportunity to change the mindset that has prevailed business from competition to collaboration. And there will be significant opportunities for companies and for banks to collaborate with other industries to bring solutions to the people that are mostly affected by this crisis. And there is obviously, of course, the potential and the opportunity to make. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I have got one question for you, but what I'll do is we'll, if you have a look at it while you're on the panel session, then I'm sure Nick will uh, read it out to you. So I'm going to go straight into okay. the panel session. Nick, I think you can introduce that. Um, we don't want to run out of time on this one. I'll, I'll let you take straight on. Thank you, Robert. And, uh, and Chris, thank you very much for a fantastic and uh, presentation. That was, that was really great. Um, so in this panel, we're going to go a bit deeper on some of the themes that, that Chris has uh, outlined. Uh, and we're going to do that uh, in, in conversation between Chris, myself and Francisco from, uh, from N26. So uh, Francisco, well, welcome. Uh, so for anybody who doesn't know me, my name's uh, Nick Kerrigan. Uh, I'm a future uh, payments expert uh, and innovation leader. Uh, I've been in the industry for sort of 20 odd years or so. Um, and most recently, I was uh, uh, the innovation lead for Barclay Cards, so MD Future Payments in, in Barclays uh, for the last, uh, last four years. Um, Chris, you've introduced yourself already and given us a really good, good sense, but I'll, I'll just turn over to Francisco to introduce himself and then we'll get the panel underway. Thank you very much, Nick. So my name is Francisco Sierra. I am the director of European Markets at N26. I've been in financial services for over 14 years, uh, started in investment banking, uh, also did some venture capital and for the last five years I've been in fintech, uh, in initially in funding circle and now at N26. N26, for those who might not know, is uh, known across Europe as the mobile bank and um, well, N26 offers simple solutions for consumers, uh, simple banking solutions for consumers. It's 100% digital and it's uh, focused on a free bank account and a debit card, very much around Great. payments. Great. Great. Awesome. And thank you for joining us. Um, thank you. I'm sure you'll have some really interesting insights to share. Um, so, 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 Chris, um, I thought what was great about what, one of the things that was great about your presentation was you grounded uh, it in very much in consumer behaviors um, and the in economic impacts uh, on people that, that are driving those behaviors. So I think maybe it would be the best for this panel to start there and talk about what key behaviors we see in it in the markets that we look at and, and what are the economic impacts? Um, so may, maybe I'll just start first because I'm sat here in, in the uh, in the UK at the moment in a beautiful uh, sunny day in the UK. Um, pe people in the UK are basically under under lockdown. Um, we are all sat at home. Um, we're only allowed out for for essential uh, trips. Um, so bars, restaurants, theaters and so forth are, are all effectively uh, closed. Um, and, and we're starting to see an economic impact. So many workers have already been uh, been furloughed. Um, and obviously, you know, people who cannot do their jobs from home uh, are unable to work. Those who can do their jobs from home are rapidly adapting in terms of being able to uh, to, to use digital systems, um, massive spike in the use of Zoom and other things like that. Um, and we're starting to see in the UK a, a quite a radical divergence in sector performance. So, um, so some sectors, obviously, those who rely on face to face are doing uh, not doing very well at all. Some of those, as Chris talked about, are adapting quite rapidly and some of those are actually doing really well. So supermarkets have seen a real spike in spend 
Um, likewise, anybody who's got an e-commerce or delivery model is actually also seeing a, a, a considerable increase in spend. So, uh, you know, uh, firms like Just Eat and Deliveroo, for example, uh, doing well, as well as, uh, you know, some maybe more unexpected ones. So companies that are serving, say, home improvement or digital services like streaming and stuff, seeing big demand. Um, so quite a divergent impact in, in the UK. Um, Francisco, what, what do you see in, in the kind of markets that, that you're ser serving? Is it similar to the UK or a bit different? I think it's very similar to the UK. It's even um, in, in some countries where it's even more restrictive uh, and the lockdown is, is um, more severe. Uh, we're seeing uh, quite a change in consumption, not only the change in behavior, but a, a reduction in consumption, right? So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. savings, is, savings are actually now increasing also because there's people worried around the situation and, and, and taking care about uh, what, what could happen next, right? So um, when, so just as, as an overall, um, what we're seeing in M26 varies very much across market, but I can tell you that in average, we've seen a drop down in payments between 30 to 50%. So 30, 40, wow. 50s, even down to 50% in, in some cases in Southern European markets. No, so no. it's a it's a big change in and in, in some cases obviously we mentioned uh, so Chris uh, Crespo mentioned the the, the ATM uh, impact we've seen seventy percent drops in in ATMs right wow. which is massive wow yeah 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 uh, I don't know if we still got Chris is Chris are you still on the line yes I'm back sorry yeah. oh good we can't see you but but let's continue the conversation so. Um, so, 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 I um, mean, in the UK, we've also seen like 50% drop in ATM uh, and cash usage. Um, so, what about Chris? About the other markets that, that you're look, looking at, do you see uh, do you see similar changes in behaviours? Do you think it's common across the world? Uh, yeah, I think I think definitely uh, the, the more traditional businesses like restaurants and, and the you know convenience stores and, and, and that, those sort of places are are definitely seeing a drop. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned here in Vietnam, the streets are entirely empty. I think the tourism mm -hmm. industry is suffering dearly. It's uh, mm -hmm. it, it really is facing a lot of problems. Um, and uh, uh, on, on the flip side, there are industries that are are really benefiting from this. Uh, and uh, as mm -hmm. we've all seen. Uh, there's, uh, for example, stationary industry. Uh, it's really quite interesting how people, mm. uh, by not having access to their office, are now able uh, are, are now in, in, in need of stationary uh, um, articles, and they're and they're going and ordering that on the, those on themselves. Also, an increase in in shipping, uh, of course, uh, mm. because mm. you know logistics become extremely important to distribute these products. Uh, so. Uh, I, I think it's, it's safe to say that because of the of, of the slowdown of economic activity, uh, payments will reduce. But of course, there are there are industries that are really benefiting from 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 the crisis at the moment, uh, and specifically most 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 of the ones that have a distribution model that can bring the products and services directly to the consumer. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so the e-commerce, maybe Nick, if I can add, the, the mm. e-commerce is obviously very obvious and, and, and the things that you need to replace or you need to actually substitute uh, are obviously very obvious. It's very interesting to see also that the change in behavior is also changing that's changing consumption around digital assets, right? Digital services. Mm. So uh, paid mobile apps, uh, streaming services, video games. Now people are spending more time, more time on the screen and that yeah. they're actually willing to spend more on on that digital services right so that's yeah also right. yeah and, that's and course, fascinating collaboration Sorry. tools because they have mm. now become essential for business and we've all seen yes. the, the rise of zoom over the past uh, four weeks um yeah. and that's really unprecedented right yeah i i thought the point francisco about the streaming services as well is really interesting i mean uh, you might have seen that the european commissioner actually asked uh you know netflix and others to reduce their sort of streaming quality um, in, in in Europe to from HD to standard because the internet infrastructures weren't uh, weren't able to cope. So it's really it's really fascinating that. And I also saw that um, some esports companies are, are reporting record levels now of of participation in and watching of esports. Um, things like uh, uh, Formula One, for example, Formula One rate. Some of the for racing has actually gone online. Um, in you know with dry, with famous name drivers <clears throat> participating in e-racing now because they can't do anything physically and and some of that and the, because of and the implication obviously for payments is a number of those things are actually pay to view right so so you're seeing a shift 
uh, not only in the location, but also where the payment is going. Very much. So maybe if I, if I can add, because as, as the mobile bank, we've been very much pushing all people or our customers to do everything through their mobile phone, yep. even actually not using their card, even if it's a contactless mm -hmm. card, why don't you pay with your mobile phone? Mm -hmm. Very much to uh, what Chris uh, Crespo was mentioning before around the keypad of the ATM, mm -hmm. there's the keypad on the point of sales, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're paying a certain amount, uh, just a contactless is not enough. You need to put your pin there. Mm -hmm. So so we uh, as, as a bank are very much actually uh, teaching our customers or letting our customers know and, and, and our potential customers that mobile payments or, or paying with the phone actually uh, outside and also at home actually, mm -hmm. not, not actually needing to put the number uh, of the card online, right? Just, just do with a pay uh, with Apple Pay is, is the way to go. And it's, and it's now, um, I say, the future uh, yeah like re we're, we're living really the future right now yeah that's a that's yeah. a fascinating point because yeah, um absolutely. i mean we can see the cash impact and we can see obviously you're, you're um, encouraging digital if, payments if I maybe i got something to that um, uh, i think it's also quite so. interesting to see how uh some of the uh, digital wallets are starting to evolve to include additional functionality that mm. might not necessarily be related to finance uh, one of the things we've seen for example in china is, uh, is how the, the chinese government is using apps like uh, WeChat and, and Alipay to track where people have been and to determine whether mm. someone has been in the vicinity of someone who is known to have been infected by the virus. Mm. So these type of demographic uh, geographic movements of people uh, are helping also combat the, uh, the eradication of the virus. Uh, and, and also they're making these this mobile wallets even more indispensable. Mm. So I believe that also the ability to extend the functionality of mobile wallets beyond just being a transaction interface to mm. also include things like, uh, well, uh, you know, the supermarket down the road is really crowded at the moment. You might want to wait another two hours before you go because it's, it's mm. a risk hazard for you to go right now. Uh, all activities that are related to the payment process can really help ameliorate the situation and make those uh, mobile apps even more indispensable for the users. Mm, mm, mm. That's a fascinating point, Chris, because actually, do you think we will then start to see actually real exploration and use of the things that you can do on mobile that you can't actually do with a physical card or, or cash? We actually really get the fulfillment of the richness of the mobile experience. Chris? I don't know if a Chris Are we still on? Use. Yes. Um, Francisco, do you, do you want to take that? Yes. Um, so, so, Nick, the question was more around the, the use of mobile or what, what exactly um, was uh, are, are we now going to see, are we now seeing a fulfillment of the, the of, my, of the potential of the potential of mobile? My bandwidth just crashed. Uh, to actually be able to, to do many more yeah, things I, I than I you couldn't with Nick other paper types. I think I think I'm listening. That there's some kind of wrong, of problem in the connection because I'm hearing both of you at the same time. I don't know if that's the case for everybody. Um, so I think uh, let me let me please answer uh, Chris. Uh, sorry, Nick. Uh, I answer Nick around uh, the use of mobile and the potential of the mobile. Um, mm, we very much uh, at N26 believe that uh, you, customers can do everything through the mobile phone, mm. right? And and even if other banks have mm, done the same or have created this mobile app, there's always this, mm, I would say, connection uh, or like, I would say this, this, mind, uh, this mindset around going to physically to the bank when you have uh, a serious need or a serious urgency. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe that now customers are being forced to actually do everything through their phones. Mm -hmm. and, and then is when they're going to realize that that exactly every single thing, not only the easy tasks mm. or the easy payments or the easy transfers are done through the mobile phone, but every single thing that you can consult and you can actually uh, validate your identity uh, digitally. Uh, we'll, we'll, I mean, we will. This will be proven in the in this uh, phase in this period that we have now, and this will radically change behaviors and will basically move uh, all banks to to focus much more on the phone and and, and customers to to use the phone 100 mm, percent and not mm, just the, mm, mm. so the, the potential of the phone is, is of the mobile phone is, is just uh, still to still to grow further right yeah 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 
Yeah, and then I think just uh, also answering that, 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 that question about whether these changes will persist, um, I think that's really interesting um, because in, in, a, in a sense, we're all sort of on standby, right? We're all sort of standby, mm. standby hoping that things will end soon and that everything could go back to normal. But I think as the lockdowns extend and as the, the changes start to really sip, sip, simmer into, into society, I believe that we will start developing new habits uh, and as you know, uh, once a habit sticks, you know, it's very difficult, difficult to go back to how things used to be before. So I think the answer to that question is directly re dependent on how long the, the, the restrictions continue to last. Um, mm. I think for now, one of the most uh, perhaps uh, marked and deep changes we've seen is how people are now having to work from home and how they are uh, getting comfortable with working from home, how they're getting comfortable with collaborating from home. And I think that is unlikely to go away, at least fully. I think that will mm. set a precedent that will mark at least how some of us continue to work going forward, even after the restrictions have, uh, have ceased. So I think similarly will happen with, uh, with, with, the, with consumer behaviors and with payment behaviors. I do believe that social is here for a long time. And of mm. course, that will always limit the, the food for physical retail uh, uh, spaces. So we will need to start uh, adapting to that uh, from now on. Uh, yeah. At least that's what I believe. I think, I think there's a very good question, uh, Nick, on, on the, from the public here. There's one that says, what actions can be taken to combat new and innovative fraud activity? Yeah. So if I can quickly answer that, um, I, I believe there are already very good and sophisticated tools around KYC, so mm -hmm. validating the customer identity. And uh, this can be used uh, further on uh, and can be used in the future also to uh, validate specific transactions, right, on a, on, on a specific moment in time. So the, the problem is not around fraud activity, it's more about cybersecurity, mm -hmm. what I believe is happening. So uh, fraud um, actually uh, with digital tracking is easier uh, than when you're actually doing uh, payments, so there, there won't be people copying physical cards, right? Uh, <laughs> absolutely, with this. absolutely. And actually, fraud is with mobile payments. Fraud are is is there's a, ma a massive drop down yeah. in fraud uh, because there's no card stealing or not pin. You need to either do a finger ID or a face ID, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it, fraud, fraud is is being reduced. However, cybersecurity obviously needs to catch up uh, needs to catch up with this and this is i would say the, the biggest question there yeah mm. uh, that's a really good point and there's there is a, but there is a debate Great. going on at least in the uk context around uh, the kyc and in particular uh, the need for liveness right so taking selfies not being enough but actually in the, uh, ensuring that you have a service that ensure that ensures that liveness is is known uh, at the point that you are identifying the, the customer is that something on your mind too francisco that is something that we are forced to do actually mm -hmm. across Europe. So the European regulation actually is forcing us to do this liveness detection. Mm -hmm. And therefore there is a video streaming uh, or in some cases actually when there's uh, difficulty in problems, there's an agent at the other side and we do a video conference for validating this. Mm -hmm. So um, N26 is now out of the UK, but we're still operating in, 24, in 25 countries and we are doing liveness detection in these cases. Mm -hmm. Right, right, and, right. And I think there's also there's also a case for biometrics. Uh, we, we we're seeing the the increase of transactions taking place over uh, intelligent speakers like uh, like the Amazon Alexa or the Google uh, speaker. So I think increasingly those biometric authentication mechanisms that help rule fraud uh, will be more important. And this is again a, a situation could help accelerate the adoption of some of those technologies like. Uh, uh, using your, your thumb to buy things from home or using uh, your voice or using uh, great great well uh, look uh, thank you uh, i'm conscious we're almost at time i'm just looking down the questions that we've uh, we've covered most of them but i did francisco uh, want to make sure that Are there the any other questions coming in we picked up uh, on the the, uh, the one about the one about how you communicate and market with customers has it changed at all Mm, in our case, it, it, it really changed because uh, our value proposition uh, is, is very much around traveling. So, mm -hmm. so unfortunately, <laughs> our, our customers actually find the biggest competitive advantage of our product is, is, is FX, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, no FX fees. Mm -hmm. we, we offer our customers a card that doesn't charge any fees or ATM withdrawals uh, outside of your own country. So um, 
obviously many of our customers use this only for traveling mm. or for traveling and other things. So we've seen also that major drop because of the, of the traveling. Our campaigns, our marketing uh, and our communication is very much also around benefits when you're traveling. Mm. So right now we had to refocus it and very much uh, we've positioned our, our brand differently, explaining that we are, it, it's, it's almost all around financial wellness mm -hmm. and that we are an app that allows you to have control of your finances and uh, keep track on a, on, on a real time uh, of your money inflows in and out and, and how important it is to actually, um, yeah, basically save and, and uh, understand how uh, to track your money. Great. So it's very much around financial wellness and, and control of your money. Great. Well, that I really makes sense that. and then talks back Indeed. to Chris's point around adaptability. I can see another question here on uh, the evolution of credit limits uh, on credit cards from the current situation. Um, I, I'm not sure. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very... Well, but do we have time for that? I think we've got to move on. I mean, I think we're going to learn on these webinars when we... when we, the moving that uh, they will sort of evaluate themselves a bit. But I think at the moment we've got 20 minutes per slot and if we overrun, there isn't, a, as I say, a tea right. break that we can catch up. So I'd like to just thank you and the panelists, Nick, because I think that was a really useful session. And I, and I, I think we're going to get better at these type of uh, webinars during this crisis. I think it's uh, certainly the way things are, are, are moving forward. Uh, and I think these provide stuff that uh, you, you couldn't get at a conference um, we just need to work out how you can get the networking and the breaks sorted out. But thank yeah, you, very much, Nick. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, and and of course, uh, thank you very much, Francesco. Um, thank you, thank you, thank we'll you. On now to uh, a, a good friend of mine, Ruta, who is at the the, the Bank of Lithuania, but also interestingly uh, on the European Banking Authority. Um, I think. Uh, it's very interesting in, in these times to get the views of a uh, regulator, of a central bank. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, financial stuff happening. Uh, all the governments across Europe and the central banks have been working to see how best they can uh, help businesses, how they can work with the regulation and what they can do. So it's uh, really exciting to, um, to hear from you, Ruta, and your 20 minutes, off you go. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you Robert for an introduction. As already said, I'm head of division at Bank of Lithuania that is responsible for uh, fintech companies for e-money and payment institution supervision. Uh, if uh, nobody, anyone need, doesn't know, so in Lithuania we have the biggest number of e-money institution license in the European Union. So we are dealing with fintechs. I am also co-chairing a standing committee of payment services at uh, EBA, European Banking Authority. But I have to say the disclaimer that uh, anything that is presented here is just my personal opinion and, and doesn't represent the opinion neither of Bank of Lithuania or, uh, or uh, 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 European Banking Authority. So having said that, uh, let's start. And I would like to, to see my slides that uh, I could uh, move it on. Uh, so truly, and now the question is, then we uh, introduced PSD2 is like Payment Service Directive 2, and it, it was about the safeness. And uh, with this directive, we said that safe is something that is authorized by a strong customer authentication. And the meaning of safe payments really changed uh, in the context of uh, COVID-19. Uh, there is just some images what I wanted to present, that there is a cashier, they, they encourage people to pay contactless. Uh, then there is e-commerce that is really disrupting now, uh, even like some companies in Lithuania, e money institutions, they have uh, bigger incomes uh, in March comparing to the last March. Uh, because of the, you know, really involvement in this e-commerce and providing the services for e-commerce. So for some industry per uh, participants, uh, especially fintechs, it's it's a time for uh, to shine. And another point of view that was already mentioned by Chris that uh, cash are also quarantine and uh, and in quarantine and uh, it seems nowadays that to pay in cash it's not safe. Having said that, I would like to present uh, some positions uh, of 
publicly available of regulators starting with European Banking Authority. So a lot of uh, authorities has issued their communications uh, encouragements as regards to the payments and European Banking Authority stressed the attention to remove payments and encourage uh, consumers or merchants to take necessary sanitary precautions with payment for goods and they stress contactless and remove payments as the ones that really ensure the necessary sanitary precautions. And also it called on PSPs to facilitate consumers' ability to make payments without the need of physical contact. Uh, there is, with PSD2, there was strong customer certification introduced uh, for uh, both for contactless payments and EBA and both other countries uh, encouraged to increase the threshold and what we see that uh, the threshold uh, was in some countries 20 euros, uh, a lot of countries increased to 50 euros. Uh, what we see that payments in Europe is really essential. Some countries like Portugal, they introduced that uh, payments are one of the essential services that has to be uh, uh, working during the current time and because it's a necessary service. So the, uh, the countries really put attention to this, uh, both to remove payments and save payments. But uh, as regard to the cash, if we move to uh, another slide, if I could, because I don't see now. Could, uh, I, I don't see the slide, so, oh yes, thank you. Uh, we have European Commission. Recently, it published a consultation payment, uh, paper on the retail strategy, retail payment strategy, and it really uh, marked some interesting insights uh, related to COVID-19. It said uh, that in emergencies such as COVID-19, safe and efficient payment system uh, and services can also make a strong contribution. Contact and payments, innovative non-cash payment solution also should be enabled uh, because everyone is at home. And it's very interesting that um, really the uh, European Commission said that instant payments are in this context becoming more strategic than ever before. So truly the COVID-19 is also a factor for European Commission to say that it's time for instant payments. Instant payments is the new normal. So what is uh, instant payment is, I guess everyone knows, because if we have instant payments, so it's really comparing the competition for cash because we can provide payments instantly, like providing cash for a payment. But uh, having said that, I really want to bring attention to the cash. And yes, of course, there is a, um, uh, uh, Bank of International Settlement had this uh, in, in interesting examination of the um, queries uh, relations to cash and COVID, coin COVID, and from this graph we saw that uh, we see that people in some countries are very active while while uh, inquiring of, about the cash and what's the connection of cash and virus. Uh, Chris has already introduced that, yes, some people see there is a threat, but uh, Bank of International Settlements, they said that probability of transmission of the virus via banknote is low comparing to the usual surface that we use. And they compared the uh, bone, both uh, pin tellers, credit card terminals, and they say, the viruses here and the backers that you can get is on the same level as you can get on the bank banknotes. So there's no sufficient evidence that banknotes itself is like more uh, longer containing virus than other other any other surfaces. And uh, to boost our trust in cash, central banks are really doing and communicating, urging uh, uh, acceptance of cash realizing and uh, like I said some encourage contactless payments but Bank of International Settlements they see that there is a shift over digital payments I guess we don't have to really to prove that it's inevitable but it's negatively 
can in fact embank on all the customers. And what we are saying that really uh, this pandemic amplify, uh, uh, may amplify calls to defend the role of cash. But also what is interesting, it said it's also central bank digital currencies. What it means that uh, because uh, cash are really uh, covered by central banks and they say if the cash is mm, no longer needed, so the central banks has to issue some uh, other measures. For example, uh, some other measures as related to central bank digital cash. Some of the mm, uh, banks like Bank of England uh, also like encouraging and saying that then polymeric banknotes is not uh, as as lower safe as other services and other you know, central banks are encouraging because there is a threat that cash will be not uh, no longer used it will be used but anyway it the the digital payments will be increased so uh, i would like to introduce the last slide of me uh, from me that really summarizes uh, what we see from the regulator's po point of view is that uh, outcome of COVID-19 could be like contactless instant central bank digital currencies. Uh, this is just, uh, like I said, my personal view, but what we are hearing here from the regulators, it's, it's really huge because uh, this uh, for like small term pandemic crisis could really evolve uh, something that we were talking like it will come in just uh, far, far future. But as we see, it is coming and coming in, and it's inevitable that it will be one day. So uh, this is my short presentation. I, I think I saved some time for coffee break, uh, but uh, feel free to ask any questions for me. Well, it does appear that uh, uh, Robert has handed over to me, uh, but I didn't know whether he was going to take the question or not. But it was a very uh, uh, interesting conversation and uh, discussion on the regulatory view. How do you think, I mean, we, we see a lot uh, specifically in the UK regulatory action uh, happening. How do you balance between, uh, from a regulatory standpoint, where in your regions, the speed of action versus uh, the thoughtfulness of making sure kind of the I's are dotted and the T's across. What uh, uh, opportunities and challenges have you seen over the, uh, over the past uh, two, three weeks as, as this uh, crisis has accelerated? So, of course, uh, you know, from the challenges, we also say that the regulators are always lagging back. And truly, yes, it is. We have to think like fintechs nowadays and to be proactive, uh, helping both uh, banking industry helping people and he helping uh, the payment industry. So from one side, yes, it is challenging. From another side, it is a push, a push for us, like regulators, to be more digitalized, to be more proactive and pro providing some suggestions. And I think the reaction from regulators uh, were quite uh, fast. Uh, European Banking Authority took some ma measures as regards banks, especially because this is a systematic risk, uh, is, are the banks and they introduced some measures. So I think it's really a good boost for uh, regulators to, to, to follow up with wh what's happening. Okay, great. And then also just, uh, I, I certainly have seen the uh, benefits and challenges of uh, kind of working from home in isolation. I, I'm curious from a regular uh, regulated uh, point of view, have you seen any differences uh, or learnings that you guys have had to adapt from a regulatory standpoint, which is something we don't necessarily see on the commercial side of payments? Oh, yes, indeed. You know, some banks, uh, even central banks, they never used to have uh, remote uh, working from home, central banks, for example. And for them, it was like uh, changing the mindset that it's possible to have a meeting, Zoom meeting, online meeting, and uh, for example, uh, the the meetings shifted from telcos to to you know any uh, online uh, infrastructure structures. And I guess uh, when we say uh, even in Lithuania we say that uh, COVID nineteen proved that it's possible to have meeting online and that it's not necessary to meet live and to spend long hours for decision. 
Another thing is for us was challenging as we are supervisory authority, we have to impose some measures to the market participants in, in, in case there is some breach. So for us, it was a really challenge because we had some hearings already using uh, some interfaces, uh, non face to face, uh, in order to, to adapt some decisions. So from our mindset, it, it seems like two, like two, uh, one uh, month ago, it was like a, not possible this kind of uh, living as a regulator, but now we have to adapt and we see everything is possible. All right, great. And uh, it looks like uh, we got Nikki uh, with a question uh, for you. Uh, how is blockchain fitting into this? So I guess if, if everybody knows blockchain as a technology is a core thing for uh, central bank uh, digital currencies. I mean, uh, everyone is thinking that blockchain could be this technology to introduce uh, uh, digital, uh, uh, central bank digital currencies. So it's very la relevant question. And I guess, uh, like I said, from other regulators, we see that it needs the emerge of this kind of uh, digital currencies of central banks. So the blockchain is definitely be, will be used. Okay, great. Well, I'm gonna, uh, I'll, I'll keep uh, looking for uh, questions, but I know uh, uh, Francisco is uh, coming online soon. So, uh, Francisco, if you want to come online uh, sooner, uh, since we don't have coffee breaks, uh, by, by all means. <laughs> is there any uh, last questions for Ruta before uh, we uh, thank her for uh, a very insightful view from a regulatory uh, and, and central uh, banking perspective? Uh, okay, great. Thank you very much. Very much appreciated. And uh, Thank you. Uh, on to our next uh, presenter and uh, possibly giving you a little bit extra time here. Uh, uh, certainly a very interesting topic in terms of where we are going from a mobile uh, perspective. Uh, uh, Francisco, uh, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, well, and th thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be with, with you on the screen. For maybe those of you who actually joined later or who couldn't actually catch uh, what I said uh, in the previous panel, just uh, I'm going to introduce myself very briefly and then 26. So uh, my name is Francisco Sierra. I'm the director of European markets at N26. Um, for those of you who might not know N26, N26 is, the, is known in Europe as the mobile bank. And uh, well, it was, a it was a bank born after the financial crisis. Uh, we launched five years ago uh, and we've grown to over 5 million customers across 25 countries in Europe and also in the US. Um, and just to summarize what N26 does is uh, N26 offers a very simple solution for consumers around uh, an account, a bank account and a debit card. We, use, uh, we work as a marketplace and connect third-party products, financial products and other non-financial products. So if we go to the next slide, should I pass it? Yeah, great. So um, there are many new growing pains around payments uh, due to this change in customer uh, behavior and uh, still not everything is, is bad news, right? So I think we need to consider uh, that there's uh, opportunities, obviously, with this, these changes and, uh, and uh, really taking advantage what COVID is, is teaching to the customers that uh, they can do many of their uh, activities 100% digital. And, and this means for us that 100% uh, digital banking is the new normal, right? So um, I would say that um, there's two things uh, to bear in mind here. That uh, first, some banks are not uh, pre fully prepared uh, to offer a full online experience and are struggling in many ways, right? So basically, uh, because our customers are struggling, right? Their uh, banks are suffering uh, and are having peaks that cannot, uh, peaks in requests or, or phone contacts or whatever that are actually uh, making the bank suffer and the customer suffer on the both sides. So that's one, one point, the banks that are not prepared to actually do full online experience. And the second one is the banks that actually, many banks actually are very well prepared to serve their customers digitally, however, their UX, so their customer experience, is, is below customer expectations. So how their app works uh, is not uh, how customers expect or, or what customers see in other apps that are non-financial, right? 
So that's, uh, I think, uh, where um, fintechs have a competitive uh, edge, right? And where fintechs uh, have an opportunity. And um, I think that is where uh, there's, I would say, biggest upside in the next coming months and, and years, right? So I think all the data that you can see in this slide, it's, this light keeps disappearing. I don't know if you can see the slides. Sorry. Can somebody bring the slides up? I think I, for some reason, I, maybe I close them. Thank you, Marta. <laughs> so, um, all right. I got the slides in front of me now again. So key banking and key activities are being hurt. And uh, this are just uh, a few numbers to keep in mind and how uh, people are now actually uh, concerned about moving around and uh, actually going and queuing and going queuing in the branch, right? So um, just to go to the next point, it's just like fintechs are more prepared than in the crisis uh, than anyone else. Um, I would say that now it's also a wonderful opportunity because some customers are forced to look um, at a new bank uh, or at others uh, that are actively, so there are others actively actually um, considering a better bank, right? So in both cases, whether the banks are not serving them properly or their banks that don't really enjoy the experience, uh, then is when customers are actually considering um, other, uh, other uh, solutions that might not be traditional banks, it could be fintechs. So that's where we see that many of the customers that actually enjoyed going to their traditional bank queuing and, and, and doing things that they've always done are now being forced to do things differently. And therefore, they're considering fintechs as an alternative for the first time. So what we're seeing is that actually the potential market or the, the, the potential target uh, of customers uh, are, is increasing with this uh, situation for the fintechs, right? So there's a, the big question is who's going to survive? Right? Are the traditional banks actually going to change fast enough? Are we actually going to see um, that uh, there are going to be new uh, fintechs actually scaling up very fast? And uh, and that I think is uh, the, the big that that's the, that I think is the big question and where we need to actually be looking at very carefully because some banks will actually fall and and, and will not actually be able to catch up. Right. So I would say that. Um, Going to the next slide. Overall, the as I mentioned, the marketing opportunity um, well for digital banking has grown, and customers that preferred um, that preferred queuing are now actually going digital. And um, as I mentioned before in the panel, uh, at N26, we're seeing customer growth uh, despite the decreasing financial activity of our of our existing customers. Right, so we're seeing actually more customers interested and in looking for a digital banking experience. So you need to advertise and communicate around that if you don't want to actually miss out as a as a digital bank. Um, and just uh, to wrap up, I would like to share uh, a few thoughts um, around what should banks be considering. I'll, I'll jump up, up and down across all these uh, five bullets. Uh, and I think the first point is actually the second one that you have in that slide is that customers need to survive without offline processes, right? They need to very much go fully digital and mobile. This is uh, the first mandatory request. Otherwise, it's gonna be very difficult, it's gonna be impossible for them to, to stay in the market. Um, the second part is uh, that banks actually have a legacy with IT infrastructure uh, that is not prepared for the sudden spike in requests or the sudden change in behavior, right? And then you need to actually bring IT infrastructure to the most advanced uh, technology that's available right now and not use and, and continue, um, I would say, amortizing or depreciating the, all the um, investments that they've made in the past in old infrastructure. That's a sunk cost. Uh, the, sec the third point actually is um, the fourth there, in, in my opinion, is the high analogous, uh, analogous process that are not allowing the business to scale quickly and to adapt, right? We've talked about adaptability and I think we need to be able to um, react quickly and uh, therefore all digital processes are uh, much more needed than any analogous or, or, or labor process uh, or, or yeah, manual process that would uh, be required in traditional old fashioned uh, banking styles or bank, bank, banking 
uh, work uh, streams. So, um, so we've talked about the, the customer experience, we talked about infrastructure, we talked about processes, and I think the last point there is, uh, or the, the last key point towards the banks, is, is more around branches and people. How do they manage their, their people and their, and their teams to actually serve the customers in a different way? How can they actually use, uh, potentially reduce uh, their employee base, but also use or change that employees to do something different and sell more online and not just be uh, face to face uh, business. So that's, I think, the four points that, are, that the bank should be uh, looking at. And uh, there's a last one, which is very much towards the regulators. And uh, maybe not all banks should be lobbying and, and working hand in hand with the regulators. But there, there is a quick need also for the regulators to make sure that uh, they allow the banks to do fix, to, to, to fix things uh, quickly and, uh, and adjust their processes uh, without going through a very bureaucratic process. Uh, and that's also banks need to be smart about how to work around this uh, regulatory requirements and uh, adapt quick and, and use the technologies that are available, right? So I would like to stop it there. I don't think I spent uh, around 10 minutes. I think we should have around another 10 minutes of questions. So happy to answer any questions. Uh, I'm, I'm actually looking at the screen. So maybe Charlotte Day is asking, do you see any traditional banks closing as a result of COVID in the next yeah. months? Uh, I, I do believe that um, that banks are very much needed in this situation, and that uh, governments are also um, f also pushing uh, lending through banks, right? So I hopeful, hopefully uh, expect many banks to be uh, actually sustaining the economy going forward. Uh, however, there are certain small traditional banks that uh, will be either acquired or integrated by larger uh, banks, and uh, th this has been already happening before the COVID and maybe COVID will accelerate in some specific cases of traditional small banks. So hopefully I'm answering that question. Uh, obviously cannot, don't have enough information to give specific names, but, uh, but I do see that potentially this will accelerate um, in, the, in the coming months. Yeah. And then second, the second question I'm seeing is uh, Maria, uh, who's asking, how do you see the lending procedures journey from commercial bank's perspective and customer's perspective to change in uh, with uh, in which time frame to change in which time frame right so um, lending um, is very much data dependent right it's very much uh, what we're seeing uh, is that um, even though we're a european bank and we try to actually have one single technology platform uh, lending is very local because of the data that's available for the customers. If there's a positive raw or if there's not, obviously it clearly affects how you do the underwriting, how you do the, the credit scoring of, of, of customers and companies. So um, lending procedures from a, I would say, from a local point of view are actually already seeing uh, changes and already seeing new players coming in, in the fintech space. Um, not only around crowd lending, but also around bigger funds actually doing alternative lending. So that's been very positive. I believe that also traditional banks are implementing this, I would say, uh, digital onboarding and this digital validation, maybe a bit slower, but they are also doing it in many cases. The most advanced uh, traditional banks were already seeing this. Uh, we're already seeing this in this uh, bigger and, and more advanced uh, traditional banks. And, and for sure, uh, lending will most probably happen 100% digital uh, in the coming months because of this situation, right? So I'm expecting that all the government uh, funding that is pushed through the banks will will very much be digital, and and then the second question we will see uh, will we see fintech companies uh, provide loan solutions to their customers? Um, well, the thing around fintechs is that they're very much focused on doing one thing and one specific thing properly, right? One specific and being the best at that one thing. So we're not seeing fintech companies offering the whole range of of products. Uh, I think the biggest advantage of fintech is actually being very good at just one thing and, and focusing on that one thing. That's where fintechs actually fill in the gaps that banks are, may actually not be uh, covering properly. Uh, still, mm, lending uh, and, and loans is core, for, um, is core for banks and they're obviously pushing that very strongly. And uh, there, even though there are a few fintechs uh, or several fintechs in, in the lending space, all the other fintechs that are working in payments, that are working in rec, uh, in rec tech, that are working 
in potentially banking uh, or, or like payment solutions uh, for uh, consumers. Um, I don't see, or, or maybe even investment, right? So when they're looking at uh, at robot advisors or similar, or similar solutions, um, we don't see these people actually moving to loans, right? They, they, uh, we we do believe that fintech will very much focus on their own space and on their own um, activity. So therefore, there is an opportunity for fintechs in the credit space to actually grow faster with this situation, knowing that um, there will be a increased demand in, in debt and in credit, right? Uh, but overall, I don't see actually fin fintechs shifting uh, to loan solutions um, apart from what they're doing right now. So hopefully I've answered these questions. The, one, the last one is, uh, will banks really like N26 open to business uh, with more fintech companies. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm reading that properly, but open to business uh, or open to businesses uh, with more fintech companies. Um, so obviously we're looking at partnerships. So um, I would say that many banks like N26 are focusing on only consumers. There are other banks that are looking at uh, businesses, right? And offering small uh, solutions for small and medium enterprises. So it, it is surprising how B2C and B2B have, has, have actually separated in this fintech services. And uh, in both cases, I am seeing um, partnerships as a, as, a, um, as key for growth, right? And uh, using PSD2 uh, and APIs as a potential, uh, as, as an opportunity to integrate uh, with traditional banks to get more data, but also as an opportunity to integrate with uh, other fintechs to offer more services. So yes, uh, going forward, we do expect much more collaboration and we do expect much more transparency uh, across um, across fintechs and banks together. Okay, great. Uh, while we're waiting for the next question, and by, by all means, all participants, uh, please uh, uh, bring your questions uh, to the, the question deck. But uh, one, one question I had in terms of, uh, you, you mentioned about, uh, and, and maybe this, this is where the last question was going. I, I, was, I thought uh, that actually uh, N26 was uh, providing some business banking accounts. Have you switched recently to just uh, yeah. consumer uh, portfolio? No, so, so the business banking accounts that we're offering are for individuals. It's a freelancer account, really. It, okay. We're offering, we're offering uh, business accounts for freelancers. So we do basically the same KYC process. So we're onboarding uh, people, not, not companies, right? Uh, gotcha. Okay. Uh, and on the, uh, are you, Thank you for the question. Are you doing any direct lending yourself or are you using partnerships to actually do that? And in this particular arena, have you seen any changes in that behavior uh, outside of the transactional banking? Very good question. Thank you very much. So um, it, it's actually very um, it's very dependent on the market and the country uh, across Europe. And we are doing both things. We are doing our own direct lending and we are doing lending through partners. So we've got a, our own product that's called Overdraft, uh, which is very much uh, focused on um, well allowing people to get to the end of the month, right? Mostly it, it's just like you can run above uh, your own uh, balance, your own cash balance, and um, that would be at a reasonable interest, right? Around 6% uh, in a year, right? So uh, that's, that's a very interesting product for our customers because they only pay for the days that they've used it without any additional fees, additional uh, opening or, or, um, or uh, servicing fees, right? So it's just uh, you pay the interest and that's it. On the other side, uh, we do have credit. We did have uh, loans, and uh, those loans go from five thousand to twenty-five thousand in in Germany and France. Uh, we do this in only in only these two countries, and we're doing it through uh, third parties. We've are, we actually integrated integrated in our platform Ox Money and United Credit as uh, credit providers. Okay, great, great. Uh, uh, in the UK, one of the things that the traditional banks are having a big challenge with is, is uh, customer servicing. Uh, the uh, you've got the compounded effect of both um, increased number of calls, trying to get forbearance on a number of uh, different banking products, on top of uh, uh, fifty percent absenteeism. What are you, uh, although you're very digitally focused, I assume you do have call centers, and wondered, you know, where where what what experiences have you seen? Have you been able to drive even more to a digital uh, servicing experience and just maybe even on the people side where social distancing is required, what policies and procedures are you taking into place to uh, allow your workers 
to continue to service your customers, but still complying to some of the lockdown uh, processes that we see throughout uh, the Europe and throughout the world. Very good question. So um, there's two parts of it, right? So first one is uh, the, the customer side. Um, we very much focus on giving an, offic an efficient service 24-7, uh, right? Because it's all through the phone. You can do it through the chat. You can do it through, you can also call if you're a premium customer. Uh, but it's very much, um, it, it is very much online and it's very much also allowing customers to to easily find their problem, their, their solution to their problem before actually uh, reaching out to customer service. So we're very much uh, focused on giving the best uh, in class uh, customer service. However, we do believe that no customer service is the best customer service. We don't we don't think that the customers actually want to reach out to an agent. We do believe that the customers want to do everything online with one click. So when we when when we have customers actually reaching uh, our customer center. Uh, are and reaching and, and, and opening a chat is because they do have a problem, right? So we're very much focused on solving those problems beforehand and and uh, making sure that we can understand these problems and, and give a solution in a more, uh, I would say, automatic way and a more uh, direct way, not only with, um, with a chatbot, uh, but also with um, other functionalities in the app, right? Still, you mentioned it and it's very important. Um, we do need the agents uh, for uh, the cases that are relevant, for the cases that are needed, and for the customers that actually we just want it, right? Those customers that want to call can call in and can and will receive uh, attention, a customer attention. Um, still, um, with this situation, um, we need to make sure that we've got our agents uh, well protected and well distanced, the ones that are still remaining in the office, and the ones that can actually have the right security systems and the right uh, I would say infrastructure from a tech point of view to actually work from home can also do it, uh, making sure that uh, the customer inf the customer data is, is very much secure and that the, the, the agent cannot take use of this, right? So it, it, it is quite tricky when you think about working from home in this kind of, uh, of uh, activities because you need to make sure that the customer data is very much protected and that those people, those agents that potentially are working from home do not have access or cannot actually uh, breach uh, any uh, any data pro data security. Okay, great. Uh, my last question is going to be a little bit controversial, and you can a answer it in, in a couple of ways. But uh, one, being a unicorn uh, within the European uh, community, uh, how has uh, your views and maybe your wider executive management views uh, been on valuation? Uh, but maybe you can take that question as you'd like. But uh, maybe even also the. Uh, investors who uh, have uh, participated in, in your recent rounds, um, how are they supporting you through this and wh what are they looking for uh, uh, to get through this and, and get to the other side and, and continue to build that enterprise value that you've promised them previously? Very good. I did have some backups lives and now that you're mentioning valuation and startups, I, sorry, and, and uh, investors, actually let me go to that slide. Um, so, so yes, we are a unicorn. We've raised uh, until now Six hundred and eighty million dollars uh, over the last uh, six years, um, and our valuation currently is three point five billion dollars. Right, mm -hmm. we've had uh, at the beginning uh, venture capital funds obviously coming in. Then we had some strategic investors such as Allianz and Tencent, um, and we've also had in the latest rounds uh, bigger investors such as the GIC, right, the so the um, Singapore Sovereign Fund, right. Uh, so we are. Uh, mm, I would say very well, uh, we have a very solid balance sheet and we're very well in, protected by our investors or covered by our investors. And our investors are have actually uh, joined us for the long term, right? For the long run. And they will, and one of their, um, of their strengths is that they will continue investing uh, going forward. And that was always the plan, right? To continue. Uh, and supporting N26 growth, uh, not not planning a, a fast exit, right? So that's, I would say, um, the advantage or the, the benefit that N26 has uh, at this uh, situation is that uh, we won't see this uh, affecting uh, massively our valuation or our uh, access to capital because of the cost of the investor base that we have. Having said that, um, it is true that we're seeing um, across the market uh, that we're hearing that uh, fintechs um, will most probably struggle now to find the right financing, to find the right funding. Um, and um, and this is actually 
something that uh, it's it's actually I would say in the wrong direction because it is the moment, it is the time to actually invest in in innovation, invest in in new ideas and new opportunities, and uh, and uh, hopefully there's also smart investors that uh, realize this and um, and bet on this uh, fintech space and continue um, yeah, supporting the fintech space. All right, great. Well, thank you. Very insightful, really uh, interesting perspective. I think you're in a very good sweet spot uh, to, to manage through this crisis, especially with the digital environment. So uh, again, thank you very much, uh, Francesco, and uh, appreciate the uh, time uh, given to this uh, webinar. So thank you. Um, thank you to thank on you. That note, thank you trying to keep up with uh, Robert's good time management. Uh, if we can move on to the uh, next uh, presentation, the uh, the challenge of the implementing legislation in a time of crisis, and a lot has happened in that way. And uh, maybe I can uh, pass it over to Ellie, our new uh, our next speaker, chair of the executive board of the European Payments Institution Federation uh, and vice president of European Government Affairs at American Express. So if you could uh, join uh, the stage and uh, take over, uh, look forward to the presentation. Take it away. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for for the invitation and for um, yeah al allowing me you know to be here on, on on behalf hopefully of payment institutions and of my own company American Express. Um, so this morning um, I would like to share with you uh, the challenges of implementing legislation during the the time of crisis. Um, if we can maybe switch to the first slide. Um, so the, the coronavirus pandemic has put a lot of pressure, I think, on, on many actors in the payments industry. Sorry, the one before, if, if I'm, yeah, perfect, the background, thank you. Um, actually, businesses had to focus their, their efforts um, in keeping their business running during this unprecedented time. And what is really unprecedented here, and we've all, you know, um, Face this, it's the global, I think, nature of, of, of this pandemic. It's not really limited, you know, to, to, to one region or, or one country. And during these times, many companies and financial services in particular had to change their operations to service the customers. And in many cases, actually relax, you know, the business to date these customers. To give you, to, so, so the customer was really the center, I think, of, of, of what's, what's going on here. And another example also that, that, that really, you know, we have been doing and many companies also um, to keep employees safe. So we had to close, you know, many premises and organize for employees to work from home. So, so pretty drastic measures that were happening. I can give you an example for, for American Express. So um, right now, more than 95% of our workforce um, globally is actually working from home, which, which is just like unprecedented. And you know we had really to 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 move things and shift things in, in in a very in a very quick manner. But these are unprecedented times, and and they need unprecedented, I would say, measures. In parallel, so with with this uh, virus spreading and continuing, you know, to 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 yeah, to change our lives, many regulations still needed to be to be implemented. Um, however, a crisis always forces everyone, you know, to focus on what is essential. And postpone what is what is less less important. However, when it comes to regulation, um, this is not a decision that you can take on your own as a company or or as an industry. Um, regulators or competent authorities or national competent authorities, as, as we call them these these days, must be engaged. And any forbearance needs to be discussed and justified with the with the whole industry. Um, I would say that it's also impossible to have the rules modified or adapted without a coordinated approach. So, so here, really the coordination between, you know, pub, the public sector and then the private sector becomes, becomes even, even more, more essential. Um, and it's, it's during these moments that, that you fully appreciate, you know, the value of associative uh, participation. Um, right, let's, let's now, you know, this is a bit the background in which, in which we're operating, but if we move to the, to the next slide, um, so today I want to discuss in particular, you know, um, two topics. One is the strong customer authentication. I'm certain that most of you today are familiar with the rules of on, on strong customer authentication, commonly known as SCA, um, and the regulatory technical standards uh, that, that, that set out the details on, on, these, uh, on these measures. Um, so SCA as such, as a principle, um, it was included in the Payment Services Directive, so PSD2, 
The main objective of the RTS is to mitigate fraud, which has been growing out of proportion, specifically for e-commerce transactions. So the European Banking Authority, the EBA, on, on March the 7th, 2018, released the final RTS, Regulatory Technical Standard, on, on SCA. So in terms of scope, um, the RTS impacts all remote transactions and contactless transactions. But before maybe going further um, in, in, into the topic, let's review the basic principle of, of SCA. So in order for a transaction to be secured, it must satisfy two authentication factors across knowledge, possession, and inherence. So what are these? So knowledge is something you know, possession, something you have, and inherence, something you are. Um, SCA would apply or merchants would need, you know, to, to, to have it in place um, when they are conducting businesses in the EEA, the European Economic Area, regardless of the currency that is used. Similarly, all cards, card schemes, issuers and acquirers in the EEA, they also need, need, need to or be part of, 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 this, of the solutions that are, that are put together. Um, national regulators in Europe are responsible for enforcing SCA against payment providers. So let's not forget that the PSD as such, the Payment Services Directive, um, is there, you know, for, for PSPs to apply. And this is one of the, of the challenges and weaknesses of the system is that many players um, in the payment chain, they need to apply SCA, but they are not actually directly, I would say, supervised by, by, by the regulators or by um, the EBA for, for that matter. And there is potential for fines to be levied depending upon, you know, the local supervisor. So merchants in practice need to work with issuers and acquirers and the cards, you know, business to ensure that they support SCA. And they have a main, I would say, um, interest here because they, they want to avoid having transactions decline. And this is they, they, their, I would say, interest, they, they, their most important interest. And consumers will not be held liable for any unauthenticated transaction. Right, so when, when we look at the, at the SCA, and let's maybe move to, to, to the next uh, slide. Can we move please to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so, there are two specific changes I would like to, to, to mention today for the cards industry. Um, there are new rules for contactless payments that would require, you know, a card holder to be two-factor authenticated once a certain threshold is met. And I'll be mentioning this um, more specifically in the, in the next slide. And then the second, I would say, uh, the second uh, area, the second specific change is regarding, you know, remote transactions or what we call in the industry card not present. Um, so SCA would apply, would need to apply to online payments within the EU, specifically where both the customer's card issuer and the acquirer are located, are both located in the, uh, in the EU. So these online transactions will need to be two-factor authenticated, and the use of a one-time passcode could be one of these factors, depending on, on the three that I, that I mentioned uh, before. So to, to authenticate online transactions, the cards industry is focused and is currently focused on deploying what we call 3DS, which is a standard by EMV Co. But I won't go into, into too much details on, on this. Um, in a normal environment already, the implementation of the RTS was already challenging and has introduced actually systemic and operational changes um, that were vastly underestimated by the policymakers. And to, to give you a concrete example here, the enforcement date was initially in September 2019, so on, on the 14th of September 2019, and this one has been pushed back to December 2020, and in some jurisdictions actually to March 2021, to allow more time for the industry to deploy authentication solutions. I'm just mentioning this example just to show like the RTS itself has been, has been very, very challenging and presented a lot of difficulties to, to implement in, in practice. Um, what were the main issues that, that, that are problematic? So first, many changes are to be made by entities that are not even regulated 
or in scope of the regulations in order to enable the ones that are to reach compliance. So you needed, you have, you know, multiple players in the payments chain and, and one party needed, you know, to, to, to implement a change in order for the other to be able, you know, to, to, to have it there or available. Some, I would say, some players were not even aware of the RTS itself. And here I'll mention, for instance, merchants um, as, as an example. Another challenge was that the solutions to authenticate um, online uh, are dependent on systems and tools that have not been deployed. So many companies are versions of 3DS, the standard I just mentioned, um, because this version would have the appropriate features benefit from authentication exemptions. The, the RTS actually includes a lot of um, exemptions, and you know you would need this 3DS, the new version of 3DS, to be able to um, to apply those. Another challenge was that there are many payments uh, use cases do not have currently a solution. I mean, I'll give you the, the, the example of from, from the travel industry. So for the travel industry, um, it, it, this industry is dependent of travel management companies and indirect agent sales. So in order for it you know, to, to be able to, to, to comply, and it's, it's, the challenges are really, really huge. I mean, again, I'm not going into details here, but you could, you know, um, read many, many communications that have been made by this specific sector or by others. Um, last but not least, you know, the authentication factors that are commonly um, used need to, need to evolve towards solutions that are not, I would say, market ready yet, such as biometry or data adherence. Um, and this would take actually years to be commonly, commonly deployed and, and to be really like this standard. So giving all, all, all the above, and considering, I would say, the current crisis, it is highly questionable whether continuing to apply some of the above mentioned rules in the RTS is the right thing to do during what, what, what we're experiencing right now. Um, I think it is vastly understood that during lockdown, because of the coronavirus pandemic, it is essential to, to stabilize and even to promote electronic payments. And this is, uh, I think, what, what we have been listening to since this morning. I think we all agree right now that you know, it is really, really essential to, to, to promote electronic payments as such. Um, why electronic payments mitigate the risk of con contagion by reducing cash usage and shortening the time at the, at the point of sale. Um, so to that effect, most card schemes and issuers in Europe have increased contactless cards limits, which allow consumers you know, to have larger transactions without having to touch a keypad. Um, so here, if, if we move to the last slide, um, I'm going, you know, to, to, to mention specifically, you know, contactless payments uh, as such. Um, so in, in, in the RTS, um, the card hold, there is a cardholder authentication once it, it, a certain threshold is met. Um, the average transaction limit that, as mentioned, you know, before, I think by, by, by Ruta, it was like between 20 and 30 euros equivalent. I would say. And there, there was also a cumulative threshold of 150 euros. So SCA would need, you know, to, to, to be triggered um, once one of these two thresholds has been, has been, uh, has been caught. Um, currently, as also was mentioned before, the threshold per transaction has been increased to 50 euros. And I'm really glad that this has happened because, you know, I remember um, lobbying, you know, the different institutions uh, during, you know, the, the, the uh, the, the, the preparation of the RTS, and we were always, you know, mentioning like when it comes to contactless, it's really important to have higher, higher limits because this is really important. I mean, we didn't know that we will have coronavirus, but we knew like consumers really like to use contactless, but we weren't, we weren't given, I would say, uh, we weren't given uh, reason. I'm glad that now it has, it has changed. Um, and this change, actually, this increase in threshold has been largely supported by government uh, payment associations and also by all the, the payment service providers. Um, it, it, it has been actually outstanding, as we discussed before, like to witness like the speed of decision making and the effort to execute here. So that, that really was, was super, super important. I would like just to mention that when it comes to, to the limits, um, we also need you know, to, to, to review the cumulative limit because we only you know, reviewed the, the limit per transaction but I think there is a need to, 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 yeah, to review the cumulative impact for completeness and, and full effectiveness. And 
one idea could be, for instance, to increase this, uh, this threshold to 250 euros instead of 100, 150. However, so on the e-commerce side, so we discussed, you know, how, how the rules have been a bit uh, ad adapted when it comes to contactless. But when it comes to the e-commerce side, um, there hasn't been, you know, the same effort, um, I would say, from, from the part of the industry and, and the regulators. You know, some industry associations and stakeholders um, had to deprioritize, I would say, the focus on SCA. And we have a real risk of, of not being ready on time come December 2020. And this is why I think, um, you know, many, many players, um, in order not to have a friction um, at the time when online shopping has, 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 well, ha has been increasing um, recently, I think it is, it is really important, you know, to, 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 to reach a sort of um, pragmatic solution and freeze, you know, I would say the, the, the plans um, until the current crisis is resolved. And to this extent, actually, um, many banking associations and, and merchant associations, for the matter, have asked for, if possible, for for a six month uh, freeze. Um, and I think this, this, would be, this would be important to consider by, by national competent authorities. I mean, I think national regulators need to play a leadership role and urgently to avoid unnecessary disruption and help the industry you know, navigate safely during these unprecedented times. It has been done you know, for contactless, um, partially, but then I think you know, competent authorities need also to look at, at, at the e-commerce side of things. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much. Uh, very insightful of you, uh, of both the commercial side uh, in American Express, but also the regulated, regulated side. We have a few uh, a few moments for uh, questions uh, as I uh, uh, move toward it, but uh, I had a, a, an interesting question. Since you do kind of uh, go from both uh, the commercial and the regulatory side, can you give me a little bit of perspective of your own views of where have the regulators done a good job in certainly the last, let's just call it the last month in terms of reacting? And where do you see uh, regulators uh, and regulation maybe doing more uh, in the next couple months to facilitate help both uh, the banking, fintech, payments world and consumers and businesses um, uh, across Europe? Um, I, I'll, I'll mention two, two, two examples. Um, and I should say, you know, it's not to please my, 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 my friends in, in the, in the uh, you know, diff different uh, um, institutions, e either in the EU or, 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 or in, at national level. There has been, you know, a, a very quick reaction, at least I, I, I can talk about the, the contactless, at least as I mentioned in, in the, regarding contactless uh, limits and thresholds. I think they, they, they have been trying to be to, 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 to act quickly and, 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 and you know and I think this is where at least from an EU perspective, the EU has a lot you know to win by, by, by being relevant um, to, to, to its citizens. So contactless is definitely an area that, that, that has worked worked well. I would say there is another area that right now you know um, is contemplating or is looking at, and it is, it is a very tricky related you know to the travel industry. And it's the whole debate around, you know, whether as a consumer, you know, um, the, the rules currently are that you are entitled as a last resort to get, you know, um, to get a refund, to get um, more, well money, to, to get concrete cash um, or money on, on your account. Um, if, you know, a certain, um, a certain event happened and you weren't able, you know, to, uh, to fly or to take or to board a flight. Um, so th th this rule is, is in the uh, in the European legislation, and the travel industry, however, I mean, we all know they they, ha they are struggling. They have been really um, under a lot of put under a lot of pressure, and I think they were considering the the possibility to also you know issue um, vouchers in in instead of you know uh, monetary refunds, and they wanted this to be just considered a as a solution, at least temporarily. And I think this is a challenge. Um, again, you have on the one hand, you know, the consumer rights, and they might need the money, I think, to, 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 to just buy, buy, buy food or, or more essential items. And on the other hand, you know, you have, you have a travel industry that, that is facing huge challenges. And some, some airline companies are even, you know, saying that we might even get bankrupt. And that's why, you know, certain governments, I think, in the EU have, have taken certain measures, you know, to try to help them. 
So this is an area I would say that is, is, is very sensitive, but uh, yeah, it, it would require, I think, an attention and, and a quick uh, decision-making process from, from the institute. Okay, well, we have a quick and probably a 30 second uh, answer on this as, we, as we're running out of time. But Charlotte asked the question Have you seen any rise in fraud or claims in the uh, contactless uh, payment theft um, recently, uh, or certainly any advantages since the uh, change has gone into effect? I would say no. The, the, quick, the quick answer is no, at least for, for, for Amex, I, I, I can mention this. Because, well, okay, I'll, I'll also mention another fact is that, you know, in the industry, we, we are, we are, well, I would say we, we have very, very low um, fraud numbers when it comes to, to contactless and online fraud in, in, in general in comparison with, 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 other, uh, with other players. So we believe, you know, this, this is essential. And, and again, monitoring and, and checking, you know, how, how fraud levels are, I think, is really key. So what we ask for here, you know, as, as an industry is not, you know, to say fraud is not important and, you know, um, no. We are committed and we need, you know, to keep the fraud limits really, really at, at the low level. But, you know, certain provisions in the SCA, and, and again, it's, it's, it's not the forum here to, to, to discuss this, um, they, they, they need to be relaxed and I don't think they are the, the, the best way to go right now. Okay, well, great. Well, again, very much appreciate your time, the, the presentation, uh, and uh, look forward to maybe engaging uh, uh, in the future. Uh, Pleasure. Very all right, uh, on to our next uh, speaker, James, uh, looking at uh, the future of payments and what it will look like and how do we value uh, and how do we trust uh, in this new world. So uh, James, Vice President and Innovator um, of uh, Societe Generale uh, and Investment Bank. Uh, so uh, over to you. I look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Oh, we may have a, uh, do you have you off mute? Let's make sure you're off mute. Uh, can we hear you? Have you started? Oh, we have our little. I thought uh, Robert would only get a touch of the phone. Whoopsie. Let's see how we're doing. Oh, that sounds a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, can, you, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Hello? Hello. Yes. Yes. Oh, there we go. There we Find go. these newfangled things called headphones. There you go. Very good. It's all kinds of craziness. <laughs> <coughs> so good morning, everybody. Uh, how can I get to the slides? There we go. Thank you very much. I'm here in London. Um, Pardon the accent, uh, um, and I do seem to have to apologize for that more often than not these days. Um, briefly, kind of more me and you know why I'm here, why people should listen. Um, I, I'm 50. I've got a couple of kids. Um, uh, things I do like, just kind of me in quick nutshells. I do love to travel. Um, I have lived in six different countries. Um, strangely enough, I do actually love my work playing around innovation and entrepreneur um, within an organization, which is a bit different than your typical um, fintech startup um, place. And um, um, over a billion different years ago, um, I was a DJ, um, nightclubs, weddings, um, and I still do love listening to all kinds of music from classical and uh new age spiritual jazz and jazz music all the way through current day hip-hop house music things of this nature um i spent 18 years in the u.s air force um i have spent 20 plus years in the financial services um, sector as well as um currently on top of being an innovator and entrepreneur um product owner and project manager here within the bank um our group strategy within SG, just real quickly, is, is still looking at how are we transforming to grow our business um, and fostering responsibility um, within the business um, and, and, and the, our various business units and service units um, to take hold of that whole transformation, um, being able to uh, change the refocus to focus on our customers, whether it's within our payment sector or capital markets, um, as well as, you know, Obviously, like everybody else, we're reducing our cost, but being able to still meet our customer needs and um, deliver what we've said we're going to deliver even during this crisis. Um, 
you know, our innovation missions are around having an open ecosystem. So we do have uh, an SG Markets platform that is open that has over 2,000 APIs out to the industry that um, trusted third parties can use. Um, and we'll get to more um, the trust side of this in a little bit. Um, like I said, we're supporting our various business lines and support lines um, in their digital transformation, as well as looking at how can we do new businesses and disruptive activities. Um, I tend to contradict um, most people in the bank um, and in the industry uh, or that I've run into around new business and disruptive activities. While I don't take anything away from um, the bigger companies or the unicorns and, and the startups like N26 that have done amazing jobs and have, have been able to secure funding and have an amazing evaluation and are doing great things internally as an entrepreneur and internally within our organization, um, we cannot have that same mentality in my mind. And so for us, new businesses and disruptive activities is how do I make the day-to-day -day job easier? How do I make that day-to-day -day job better for our employees while still meeting all of our needs to our customers front facing? Um, like I said, as we're accelerating the digital transformation and we're promoting innovation within the organization, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the bank is looking at, at, at three key pillars around our client experience, our operation, and trusted third parties. Um, so, you know, looking at reinforcing state-of-the-art expertise in various areas around technology, cybersecurity, uh, making sure we've got <clears throat> the right person doing the right job, um, as well as different operating models. So how are we doing our payments today? Um, how are we doing our payments yesterday before the lockdown here in the UK and before the coronavirus? How are we managing it in the current environment, but then what innovatively and, and what are we looking at to what tomorrow, what is tomorrow really going to look like? Um, and so those are, those are the questions that obviously everybody on the call today is, is, is here for and, and we're all asking ourselves. Um, innovation, unfortunately, or fortunately, um, is similar to artificial intelligence. Um, it's really no longer a buzzword. Um, as we know, we're looking to try to improve what we're doing today, experiment on for tomorrow, and then um, I think the positive side of the virus and the lockdown is it's really giving organizations a chance to explore what is the new bit. What are we? What have we typically done face to face, old school by paper, um, that we really now need to take a look at? and go, can we automate this? Can we bring technology into it? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, can we, can we improve the efficiencies and change it for the better while still maintaining all of the needed internal controls and processes, um, data security, um, meeting all the regulatory requirements and what that's going to do. Um, like I said, I still argue the fact that innovation has to happen day to day at an employee's desk, or in this case, in their kitchen or dining room, um, and, and look at how can, we, how can we at least make sure we maintain and keep the wheels on the bus moving, if you will, while also spending time looking at how do we improve and, and, and bring newer technologies in for the tomorrow, but at the same time looking at how can we answer our customers' needs that we normally wouldn't have done or we don't know that they need, and then bring that to scale and bring that to the market quicker. Uh, one of the things for me that's um, a big question, not only around cybersecurity, but it is all around data and trust, is just because we have the data and we have access to the information, should we use it? <clears throat> um, I recently read an article in the New York Times, there's a startup company in the U.S. doing facial recognition. And uh, one of the presenters earlier talked about facial recognition for uh, being able to confirm the identity of the individual. Um, this startup company was using it as a way to help identify people and stop crimes, arrest criminals, um, somewhat esoteric in a positive look. However, it was stated in the article that they were violating the rules in terms of service for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, because they were able to just troll and get those images and, and use it just because they could. Um, and then they turned around and they've sold it to the um, Department of Justice in the U.S., some local and state police agencies, 
Um, and so for me, that begs the question of how are we really policing it? Um, thankfully, here in Europe, we have GDPR. So a lot of that most likely wouldn't have happened or wouldn't have been so open about it. Um, but those are the concerns. And then on the flip side of this, and if we can get back to the slides, please, um, would be how do we trust the people that are doing this work? Um, are they... You know, if we look at if we look at the players within the payment area, um, uh, here we go. So, you know, we've got all of the normal third-party intermediaries in the whole payment structure for straight-through processing, getting to the bank, whether it's it's B to C or B to B. But how do we trust it? What is it? you know? I mean, I think we may have to go back. Um, kind of take a step back and really look at what is trust being, you know, do you believe that the person will do this action in the future, whether it's positive or negative? Um, and obviously, if it's negative, we wouldn't want to do any business with those individuals or those organizations. But trust really looks at what are they going to do? And do you believe that they are going to continue to do that action in the future while reputation is the opposite side of the same coin. It's looking at what have they done in the past. It's the predictive, it's the historical view of this. And this is where I get into, well, just because we can, should we look at the data? The other part of that is, okay, we should look at it and I agree with it, but then how far back should we go? Should we go back to the beginning of time? Should we go back five years, 10 years, three years? Um, you know, at what point is, is back to, you know, going too far back because people have changed, things have changed. Um, and we run into those various and changing situations. But reputation, I think, is important because it it allows you to then better have, and it supplements your ability as a business to go, yes, I trust those people. Um, and we, we sh I think and feel we should look at this from a supply chain management both as, as, a, as a financial services organizations of, do we trust and do we believe the reputation of those parties, counterparties that we're doing business with, whether it's SWIFT or any of the other KYC um, onboarding reporting and whatnot that we're doing, all the way back to, do we trust those customers to continue to do what they say they're going to do? <clears throat> um, and in payments, especially if we look at tomorrow being 100% digital, 100% on our phones. Um, do we as individuals, do we as corporates actually trust our, our clients? Do we trust the people that are we're using to process our information, whether it's third-party vendors? Um, obviously, we trust our own employees. Um, but there is that question because we've seen in the financial services industry, since 2008 that, you know, all manner of financial services institutions have been fined because employees of the organizations have been naughty and ended up in front of the regulators, ended up in front of, you know, governmental bodies accounting for their actions on why they've done X, Y, Z. <clears throat> so to kind of bring this back together and tie it in from a, an innovative section of going forward in payments, it, to me, I think there's two bits is we have to make sure we've got proper ways that we should be able to and, and quantifiably show our regulators, our senior managers within the various organizations that we do trust who we're doing business with and, and what's happening is correct. And that these customers from a supply chain perspective have a proper reputation that protects ours. Because as all organizations, whether it's American Express, N26, any of the other organizations and, and people listening in on the call, as an organization, we have a, a care of service and duty to protect the reputation of our organization. Well, the customers that we're doing business with also have a knock-on effect to our reputation. And I feel we should be also looking at that um, as a way to protect our reputation and really answer those questions of should we or should we not be doing business with those individuals and organizations. Um, but truly from an innovative perspective, and I'll, and I'll end here um, to open up for, for questions, and is I don't think we will really know what 
tomorrow looks like um, because we don't really know what the technology is going to be. Uh, and I think we're going to be stuck with looking at what, like I said earlier, what are we not, what traditionally have we not done um, electronically, automatic, where there's still human intervention and how are we looking at, do we, can we remove those people to go do other things, smarter things, better things with their time than pushing paper from one fax machine to another? Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, James. Uh, we're certainly open for questions and thank you for your effective uh, time management uh, on that. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I didn't actually apologize for my American accent either. So uh, <laughs> I think uh, we're all in the same boat. Uh, but uh, certainly the collaboration across uh, countries has certainly uh, uh, shown itself to uh, be uh, far better during crises when, than when not in crisis. But uh, on to the subject at hand, yeah, GDPR. I always found it interesting, uh, uh, although it was there to protect customers uh, uh, and such, uh, certainly in light.